How's it going, everyone? This is going to be a relatively quick stream. I've got someone coming over in uh, 45 minutes. So the goal is to quickly see kind of what the 6502 perf is looking like, see if there's anything we can quickly fix up. So I just updated the server here, so I should have perf now. Yep. Okay. So right where we left off last night, we saw that the scaling over multiple threads is pretty bad. So if I spin up a... Uh, oops. If I spin up a single thread here, it immediately starts, uh, and everything's looking good. Performance looks great. Looks like uh, about 300,000 per second on a, on a single hardware thread. Um, actually, probably about 320,000. And when we bring up more threads, so if we bring up like 128 threads, we see that it takes a really long time for execution to start and I'm not quite sure why so that is the first thing that I want to do um, and the performance actually has gone down with uh, multiple so there are a couple things in here that I know are issues so the currently way that we handle um, uh, indirect branches here is we just return out and if I look for ret I think that's the only ret we have obviously on traps we have a ret um, but on this branch indirect, we end up returning out from the JIT, which then means we handle the, um, we handle that down here. So we'll get the branches here. We'll update all of the branches. And that means that we're kind of emulating the branches. Uh, so anything that's doing like a hot loop or any, any loops are breaking out of the JIT, uh, which is going to cause all this code to get executed every case, um, which is, or every branch, every indirect branch, so all of the rets effectively, uh, and that's that's something that needs to change. Um, JIT tracing sh should be off, so what I want to do is I want to first figure out why the startup time is so slow. That is, that is the first issue, and then we're going to start adding a lot of statistics around everything to see uh, where we're losing, um, where we're losing those costs. So... We've got a loop here. So this this is the hot loop. This is where everything is done. So for every billion instructions, which is about, on this processor, about every second, uh, we just do all of this processing. And that means that we only sync, we only get this lock to the global stats um, once every second or so. So it means that we locally buffer all the statistics and all of that information, like fuzz cases, and all of that happens locally until it's been a billion uh, cycles, and then we break out of this loop, and then we update the global statistics structure uh, with the local statistics here. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to comment out run. This is going to mean we're not actually going to run any uh, cases at all, and we're going to see if this makes things spin up faster. Okay. Um, that did seem to have an effect. So I, basically, I need to figure out where in this loop we're having our bottleneck. And let's put this to uh, how many threads do we have? Let's set a uh, number of threads. Let's set this to 256. We'll bring all the threads online. And let's see what we got. So this creates a new statistic structure that's kind of cleared out. Um, yeah, this is saying 3 billion iterations per second is how fast this is if we don't call run. Um, so that's basically our overhead of our statistics gathering, of invoking the fuzz callbacks, of resetting the VM, kind of all that stuff we can do about 3.2 billion times per second. Uh, yeah, which means that's clearly not the bottleneck. <laughs> um, that looks fantastic. In fact, we see the enter cycles actually is... 9% of the CPU time is spent here just due to the like 30 cycles imposed by each of these RDTSC instructions. Um, that's kind of the margins that we're dealing with here. Um, this code is, is designed to be incredibly optimized. Okay, so... So we've got the, the fuzz callback. We update only if there's a fuzz callback. We call the fuzz callback. In fact, if I don't have a fuzz callback here which technically I don't really need. We can just get rid of this and a coverage callback. We're not using either right now, so we can just get rid of both 
In fact, we can just delete this code. Because, I, yeah, I think both of those are conditional. And then coverage here, we can get rid of this. Okay. Let's see how this looks. Now it seems like it's taking a while to spin up. So um, I'm going to look for a dot spawn in invocation. OK, so here we're spawning threads. So I'm going to say print spawning threads starting now. And this will hopefully give us a good idea of when um, everything is coming online right away. OK, so that was almost instant. And then there's a pretty significant delay here. And I would consider that to be an unacceptable delay. Uh, so then let's see, um, print spawning thread this, their ID. And now I'm going to look for basically the shape of this. I want to see if it's like a logarithmic thing. Um, and then I'm also going to put a print here, print all threads spawned. OK. Uh, processor, fork from that. See how it gets slower towards the end? That's never a good sign. So when it's getting slower at the end, that's likely due to it. Um, I'm guessing that's due to the Linux kernel being slow. Um, and one thing that we can do to try and alleviate that is we can try and pin to the cores. So let me get a let me get some code that lets me do that. Uh, TKO fuzz franzia shared. Um, uh, where would I have this code? libtko source. No, I'm looking for a file called threading.rs. Thread dot star or thread? Really? Thread? Threading dot rs. Okay, here it is. So this file um, has OS specific uh, knowledge to like enumerating all of the processors on the system and then also pinning to the correct processor. So we're gonna grab this code and just whack it into. Uh, we're gonna want to put this file in. We're in soft serve. Oops. Soft serve. We'll put this in. Uh, it makes most sense in Folk IL. We'll put it here. Oh, we already have threading in there. Okay. Let's make sure. It's probably the identical version. Yeah, it is. Okay. So, um, pin to logical. Oh, we are pinning. Are we already doing this? Threads, OK, max threads. This, threads, we go through all of these, and then we pass it the processor, and it should be pinning to that. Well, that's really interesting, because when I, so if I do um, something, something does not seem right there. Uh, if I spin up, let's spin up uh, eight threads. I would expect to see all of the processor activity on one, the first eight cores. And we see that the processor activity is kind of split among a couple, um, which means our thread pinning is not working, which is really weird because I've used this code many, many times before. So let's take a look in Folk IL source threading, pin to logical processor on Linux. Oh, shit. It doesn't do anything on Linux. Get logical processors. OK, so that does work. If I spin up 257 threads, does this complain? So what I'm afraid of is that Linux is uh, moving those around. So it only spun up uh, 256 threads. So let me actually see if the old the other threading file has it implemented? Source threading? I don't think it does. Get logical, pin to logical. OK, we don't have that. Um, to do that, I think it's, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, 
what is that on Linux? It is pthread. Let's see if this will get us in the ballpark. pthread create, um, pthread exit, pthread join. No. Hmm. I think it's pretty easy. It's just a bit mask on Linux. Uh, Linux pin to logical processor. Uh, that one might get us ballpark. Task set. And schedule set affinity. Okay, so this will take a PID. It'll take the CPU set size, and then the CPU set is just a bit mask. And if I'm not mistaken, it's based on... You use these macros, but I think it's uh, I think a CPU set T is a uh, um. I need to figure out what type the CPU set T is. Uh, we can go into user include C tags R dot uh, C tags R user include. This might take a second. Um, I, I think it's, I think they're actually U32s. Come on. Okay, so we'll go to pin logical processor and we'll do, uh, somewhere we should have some extern stuff here. Yeah, so we'll make a config for Linux. We're gonna have a call to schedule set affinity. That's gonna take a PID. CPU set size. And a, a CPU set, or mask, technically. And let's say this is meet 32s. I don't know if that's the case yet, and it returns an i32 like everything in Linux. So I should be able to do an unsafe call to this uh, PID, uh, Rust get PID. There's like a way it's like a uh, process. Um, uh, PID, process ID. Here we go. Okay. As U size. And then we'll pass it. Does it set its own? Well, I guess it will, because uh, it will be based on that. Okay, then... Let's see, did that C tags finish? Yes, it did. Tags, okay. T, CPU set T. What? It is a CPU mask. CPU set size divided by NCPU bits times size of CPU mask. And this is CPU mask type, uh, looks like Ulongs. Okay, we can deal with that. And then this is uh, 1024 bits, uh, 1024 divided by 64, uh, 16. So let bit mask is equal to OU size 16. Assert um, bit mask uh, standard mem size of val bit mask times eight is equal to 1024. Uh, whoa, bit mask size incorrect. Okay. Technically, we could divide it down. We could have this. Uh, we could do standard mem size of u size 1024 divided by this times 8. Okay, that's the logic that they use. So that'll be 1024 divided by 8 times 8. Okay, perfect. And then uh, the size. What does this take? Is this the size in elements? 
is the length in bytes of the data pointed to by mask. So we'll say um, standard mem size of val bit mask, and then we'll pass a uh, mutable bit mask. And then we're going to assert that this is equal to zero. Failed to pin to uh, core. Make this mutable. Okay, that, and then we'll want to set the specific bit. So bit um, byte index, or uh, this is going to be uh, uh, usize index is equal to, what does NUMA info contain? NUMA ID, okay. So hopefully those are sequential. NUMA ID, we'll just pretty print this. Okay, looks good. And uh, expected U32, yeah, we're saying U size for this instead. There we go. Okay, expected a U size. We'll just slice this up. Uh, okay, fine. We'll just do this uh, as mute pointer. Okay, so this should fail because the bit mask is all zeroed out. Um, but I just want to see what this NUMA ID is. I want to see if it looks relatively sequential. Hey, meta construct, how are you doing today? Um, failed to pin to core. NUMA ID, NUMA ID zero. Oh, oh, we don't fill in the NUMA IDs. Um, we're just gonna take in a uh, 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 core ID. This is just gonna be a U size. Then we're gonna get the U size index is equal to the core ID divided by standard mem size of U size. So the core ID divided by that times eight, and then we'll get the the uh, bit index, which is going to be the core ID mod this. So core ID divided by this that will give us the U size uh, that corresponds to it. So that'll be divided by sixty four, and then this will be mod sixty four, and then what we should be able to do is bit mask U size index, or equals one shift left of bit index. So um, this should be uh, set the uh, affinity. Okay, that should look good. And then uh, down here on pin to logical, this will take a thread ID, and that's just a sequential identifier. So that should hopefully get us uh, what we want. Oops. Okay, so we spun up eight threads, and well, that that didn't that didn't work. Really, really, really. Um. I mean, that worked. Let me just print these two. U size index, bit index. Like I've done this a, a billion times. This should be right. What overhead do you eliminate uh, by pinning to a core? Um, that's basically the OS. Like re Linux will will move things around to like the most free core, and it'll try to dodge ones that are on like hyper threads. So it'll try and put them on physical processors. And when you move a when you move a um, when you move a thread, it's pretty expensive because you have to you have to potentially interrupt the thread and make sure like you can or on the next context switch, you're gonna move it over to a different processor. That processor is not gonna have anything in cache, which means basically every access that that thread makes temporarily for the first like little bit of time is all going to miss cache. 
and then it's going to go to memory, which means you're going to have all these things fighting over memory. So, so it doesn't look like things are getting moved around. Um, oh, I was supposed to look at the prints. Uh, zero, okay. Use size index or equals one shift bit index. Yeah, that's, that should work. Um, maybe, maybe the set affinity stuff. There, there are technically macros you're supposed to use to like set set these things up to actually like um, to set the correct bits, which are just a bunch of C macros. Um, but since I'm in Rust, I don't have access to those macros. Let me actually see. It seems like I'm only using these three hardware threads right now. But yeah, the the goal is to effectively just dodge. Um, uh, the goal is to dodge having things scheduled to cores that have nothing in cache, which is going to cause a run on RAM. So let's see if this uh, uses all cores. It's not. Okay, so... Um, cat proc... Oops, um cat proc cpu info we might need to parse something out of here um core id 71 does it take a core id no crap core id uh core id space i don't yeah, this has reuse. So that is saying like what physical core things belong to. And then, huh. I don't think it would use the APIC ID. That would make no sense. CPU set macro. Let me just take a look. Um, I can look in tags. Uh, CPU set. CPU set S. I think these are supposed to be sequential IDs. CPU set S. This is going to get the CPU over 8. What? God, how do people write this shit? Um... Oh my god. Access function functions for CPU masks. Maybe they do them 8 bits at a time instead of the 64 bits, although that should have the same effect because we're just we're just setting uh 1 bit in these arrays. Now there's a chance that maybe our um maybe for some reason our process ID is getting kind of horked here let's let's take a look at our process id that should be the thread id on linux something seems a little bit off there i don't know this is not necessarily worth the the time right now since we don't have too much yeah that should be um i need to get the thread id um linux get tid i think that's the issue so we're gonna we're gonna use uh, fn get tid. This returns a u size, takes no arguments, and we're just gonna do get tid instead. And I'm gonna suspect that Rust is actually getting the process ID, and I want the thread ID because otherwise it's setting the affinity for like basically the the main worker thread. Um, that is likely the issue. Um, what? What? I mean, we can... R really? Really? Is that not in libc? That's de There's no glibs... Okay. Okay. Um... <laughs> uh... Is this a glibc thing? Let's see. Oh my god. 
You ki are you kidding me right now? Is there seriously no get tid? Can I do it in Rust? Uh, is this get tid? That's gonna call. Oh my gosh. Thread ID. If you have a join handle, you can get the ID from the underlying thread system. Okay. So if we have a join handle, then I can request the thread ID from this somehow. Uh, join handle dot thread extracts a handle to the thread. Okay, we're gonna have to go that route. So we're gonna say thread ID and then the core ID. And wow, that's that's kind of gross. Uh, we can make it work. We can make it work. So instead of pinning to a logical processor, this is now going to be uh, uh, we're going to specifically call it out for Linux. And then when we spawn a thread, uh, we're going to temporarily get access to this. We're going to say let's thir is equal to this, spawn the thread, we're going to eventually push that and we'll say print spawned thread with, yep, with tid this, and then we'll do id, and that's a thread id, what is, what is a thread id, what is a thread id? Oh. Is there a thread current ID? Okay, there might there might be a way of, of getting it in the current thread. I don't know why the other thing seemed to not mention that. Um, we'll say print thread ID is this, and then we'll do standard thread ID was uh, approximately ballpark. Uh, pinned to the logical processor. Yep. Good. Okay. And what did that do? Thread current. So standard thread current dot ID. Okay. Expected two parameters. Yep. In this case, we only care about the core ID again. And What, what, what? Thread I need, uh, yeah, 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 that's gonna be, well, we don't know what that's gonna look like yet, so we're just gonna print, and then, yeah, that's passing a new info. How's this building before? Weren't we, like, testing this? Pin to logical processor, and then we, uh, throw ID, oh, I probably, uh, reverted that change. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, that's not the thread ID. <laughs> Great, okay, uh, get tid, Jesus Christ, how hard is it going to be to get my thread ID? I don't think syscall exists. Let me see... Um, ID, U size. I'm just going to see if this can be invoked. Let's see if this links. I don't know if syscall is implemented in headers like all the other stuff. Okay. Okay, so we can look at uh, Linux 64-bit syscall list. And we can look for a get tid. 186. So we'll do a get tid. Let tid is equal to this. Print actual thread ID is tid. <laughs> Gotta jump through some serious hoops to get a fucking thread ID. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, okay, that look, yeah, those look like actual thread IDs. Jesus Christ. What a, what a world we live in. All right, let's uh, spin up eight threads. And then this uh, as a 
U size. Uh, we'll do a try into dot unwrap just in case we have a sign issue. Whew. Uh, okay, fine. We'll do it as U size and we'll assert tid is greater than zero. All right. Hey, okay, now we see CPU usage only on the first eight threads. Perfect. It's what I wanted to see. So we've definitely pinned to those threads, uh, to those cores. So now we should be able to bring up 256. Uh, and, jeez, that was a, a surprising amount of work. Okay. So now these will be pinning to a core. I don't know if this will have a huge effect. It will have a non-zero effect, but it might not really be human noticeable. It might be just tiny. Spawning threads. Three, four, five. Okay, all threads spawned. So let's see what happens if I have... Um, so these fuzz threads, what are they doing? If I were to have them just spin, if I had them just busy loop, do they come online fast? This is going to tell me, is it allocations that they're creating that's slowing them down? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what that is telling me is that we're, we're literally just bottlenecking on Linux. <laughs> There's nothing we can do. Uh, there's literally nothing we can do. Linux is just taking five seconds to spawn these threads. Um, so that is not in our control. Um, that is likely probably due to some of the new like spe specter and meltdown mitigations because they're probably having to create a different uh, like page table for a lot of these things. Uh, they actually probably shouldn't for each thread. But this looks nice. Pinning two cores does make it a little bit more consistent. Um, like we can see everything's just pegged. 100%, which is exactly what you want to see. If we switch this over, um, if we got rid of this, we might see a small amount of movement where we might see some drop down temporarily, and that's typically due to things getting rescheduled on another core, and then they're taking kind of a perf hit um, when that happens. So we can see that they're spinning up on just random, random cores, effectively. Not random at all, but... Um, so here we see that some are, like, really low... Like, some are still really low, even though they're being used. Okay, and then, like, this one dipped down. Um, they do seem to converge to looking good. Eventually, they won't be moved around. Like, the, the kernel will just stop moving them around. But pinning to cores is just a, a good idea if you know, like, how many cores you're going to pin to. Now, it can get dangerous because you get in situations where um, these maybe are in order based on like random ordering and you end up pinning things to uh pinning things to like hyper threads but we can see that they do converge to 100 percent a lot faster in this case where in the other one we saw like a couple were lower uh because we're telling the processor that it doesn't have an option or we're telling the os it doesn't have an option where to put these threads so we kind of take that decision away from it so it's not trying to get fancy and move things around between threads um I don't think that will have a perf impact. So right now it's uh, 4.5 billion uh, cases per second, but we're not doing anything. So that spin up time, I guess we're just gonna have to eat, which sucks. I really hate a five second spin up time because it's not my fault. Um, I wouldn't have that problem in my own kernel. It makes me sad. This is why I hate working on Linux um, or any OS. Um, okay, so. Now let's take a look at what happens uh, when we bring them up and have them actually go off to do fuzzing. Um, we should see hopefully similar progression. It might take a little longer for them to spin up because now they're actually going to page things in. They're actually doing some memory operations. They're going to perform some allocations. Um, yeah, it's taken a lot longer for them to spin up, which is really annoying. Is that convergence uh, time because the prefetcher is slowly getting smarter? Um, wouldn't it make sense to use the number of physical cores instead of hyperthread and pin to every other hypercore? 
Um, no, you definitely want hyper threading. Hyper threading is a huge perf benefit. I don't know, like, I don't know who started the rumor of like hyper threading is bad for perf, but in any realistic case, it's always better. It's always like a 10 to 30% performance improvement. Um, so I absolutely need to be using all the threads. Um, it's, it's pretty substantial. Um, otherwise when you have a memory operation, you're, you're, core is just sleeping so it allows it allows your cores to be used while you have like expensive operations going on the only situation um and like if you google like oh hyper threading slowing down your stuff you'll find like academic papers doing benchmarks that are only doing raw cpu operations then of course in that situation hyper threading is just overhead but if you're doing any real computations where you actually touch memory it's always better to have hyper threading so, um, and I've tested it on this core. It's actually about a 2x speed up on this processor. This processor specifically, so this is a, a very unique processor. This is not a normal processor. Um, this processor has four-way hyperthreads, so hyperthreading. So it has uh, four threads per physical core. And effectively, um, since they added that, they actually added that so they can relax the die size for each individual core because they can make the core not have as good of outer order processing. So it doesn't um, move instructions around as well as a traditional processor does. And it's actually a big performance hit. It, it's, a, it's a huge perf hit. Um, but then they added this like many way hyper threading to kind of get over that. So yes, while it's going to stall when one thread is trying to like perform some operations cause they're not getting reordered to be faster. Um, it kind of gets around that by just throwing this hyper threading at it. it it's actually, uh, uh, really cool. Um, it's pretty fascinating. Okay. So in this case, let's take a look at, um, it might be an issue due to the fact that we're having all of these crash due to an exception. So I have like a really interesting memory model in my, um, oh, and there's another question. Uh, is the convergence time probably be because of the prefetcher getting smarter? Not really, uh, the hardware prefetcher, if you're talking about the hardware prefetcher, the hardware prefetcher will like within a microsecond converge. Um, so that, it, it will like, it'll learn within like four or five axes of, uh, of memory. So it won't be the case there. You, you would never notice that really as a human, unless you obviously made a very specific case to amplify the effects of that. Okay. So we have some scaling issue here and, um, uh, first thing that I like to do when I have scaling issues is I like to see, um, if I'm doing syscalls, because the kernel is always the bottleneck. If you're doing syscalls, your code's slow, because the kernel's slow. Uh, syscall transitions are extremely slow. Um, Linux kernel is really slow. It's just, if you're doing syscalls, stop optimizing your code, because you clearly don't care about the perf of it. So, in this case, we see that we're just seeing a sleep and a write. Fantastic. This is exactly how I designed my code. We're not hitting the kernel at all while running. This is, this looks great. We're, we're hitting our sleep for our print and then we're writing to the screen for our print. Everything is done in the process. We don't have anything going to the kernel. So let's, uh, let's see if that scales up to 256. And then this will immediately tell us, is our perf issue based on bottlenecking on syscalls? The answer is no in this case. Um, likely no. It, it's, it's possible that when we bring more threads online, uh, so here we see like all the M maps. This is the these are the threads coming online and performing the first allocations, and they're basically getting their first uh, heaps. In fact, the actual uh, thread creation probably probably does that itself. So we're seeing for each thread as it comes online, we're seeing an M map call, we're seeing an M protect. This is setting up. Uh, yeah, in this case, it's actually setting up the stack. Uh, we see the clone, which is the actual forking and creating a thread. Uh, we see the Burke, which is uh, creating new space for probably a heap in that case, like the libc heap. Um, so everything looks pretty solid here. Obviously, we haven't gotten to the point where everything's online yet. Um, so we know that it takes significantly longer for things to come online uh, when we actually have them going to that to that run function, which 
performs the the fuzzing. So I'm just waiting to see if these comes online. And here we go. Here we go. So we see a, a couple few texts, but very rarely. Um, the kernel. I mean, we're we're doing like literally three syscalls per second. So the kernel can handle that. Like as long as your syscall number is under like a thousand per second, don't worry about it. Um, if it's at a hundred thousand a second, still probably not a big issue, but it might start becoming an issue. Um, but we can see that right now our bottleneck is definitely not kernel related. That means there's something inherent to our code, which is great. It means it's our fault. And when things are all our fault, that means we can fix them. Um, if we found out that we had like something going on in the Linux kernel uh, that we didn't have control over, then there's not much we can do there other than write our own kernel and, and, and move this code into it um, or submit patches. But they wouldn't submit patches for like one-off optimizations. Or they wouldn't accept patches for that. So we know that when we call run, we run into issues. And run, obviously, is where like all the grunt, all the heavy hitting stuff is going. So um, while all the threads are disabled, that's fine. JIT entry address, good. I'm looking for anywhere where I might acquire a lock. If I'm acquiring a lock, I'm potentially blocking things. So in this case, um, if this doesn't contain the key, we're going to go to the master cache, and we're basically going to request uh, this entry from the master cache and this. Um, so we want to make sure that all of these things are arcs. So master cache, insert. This is putting a base and... Whoa. Uh, that's putting graph.clone and graph has been wrapped in an arc. So we're not that's not an expensive operation. That's just an atomic increment of a reference counter. So that's not a big problem. And we shouldn't be hitting this uh, frequently. So this is the like print requesting from master cache. And we keep a local cache per thread such that we don't have to acquire that lock to get the the master cache entry for in this case, this is basically the IL block, and I'm going to get rid of this warning before we end up missing a more important warning. Okay. So this will spew a bunch of stuff to the screen, uh, and basically we want to see that this quiets down. So we should see, in fact, uh, yeah, immediately that quiets down. So let's bring it to up to 8, and we'll make sure that the other threads are working. And they probably should be. So requesting from master cache, that looks good. So everything's fine. They're requesting some of these blocks uh, from the master cache a couple times, and then they stop. Um, that's exactly how this cache is meant to behave. So we know that this if case, this if statement cannot be the bottleneck because it just doesn't, it doesn't access that master cache, uh, or this doesn't get executed frequently enough. Um, these are all local. Uh, oh, one second. Getting a phone call. All right, so my friend is almost here. Um, I'm going to see if, if he has something to do for a little bit so we can continue on this. Uh, but I'm going to have to go answer the door in like 10 seconds here. Okay, so this is... Okay, so we know that the bottleneck is not in this. Oh, there it is. I'll be right back.
All right. I don't know if you have a good view there. My friend's over, and he's uh, he's gonna check out uh, the stream from the uh, creator's desk. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna try and wrap this up relatively quick. But yeah, this is Mark. Say hi, Mark. Yo, hey everybody. What's, what's good? Can I take a picture of you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I posted on Twitter. Like, <laughs> 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 you. Yeah, so we're trying to figure out why this isn't scaling effectively. So um, I'm like spinning up more and more threads, and we're running into an issue where uh, with like one thread, it comes online like right away, it starts fuzzing, everything's good. And when I run this, we'll see that it's getting like 250,000 or 300,000 is what it converges to, fuzz cases per second. But then when I switch to like 64 threads, it takes much longer to start up which is fine. We've determined that that's kind of out of our control because Linux is doing stupid stuff. Um, but the perf actually drops. Mm. So that means we're probably hitting like a lock or something. Um, so we're going through, we, we know that it's in this run routine. I think we know that, right? Uh, let's see if we have linear scaling. Uh, so when we comment out this run, which is like all the work. So the only things we're doing is like resetting memory here. Um, so with a single thread, and these numbers are just going to be bonkers because it's not doing anything. <laughs> but basically, I want to like see what this converges to. Um, I'm going to grab this number. This is like how I typically optimize. You you see that I I'm not bringing up a profiler because like profilers are just misleading. They'll like they'll tell you like where a bottleneck is, but typically not like the fundamental bottleneck. So this is the perf on one thread. And we'll bring up uh, all 256, and we should see a minimum 60x, a 64x multiplier. We're bringing up 256 threads, but it's a 64 core machine. And since we're not actually like doing a bunch of loads, uh, we don't expect to see like perfect scaling. So I want to see like I want to see like 70 or 80x from this number, and this will tell me it looks like approximately we have perfect scaling. And it looks like it's about 100x, uh, which is even better. So if I switch to this, divide it down, we'll see that we're at, yeah, 94x. And it's a 64 core machine. And that, for uh, Dominuk, there you go. We are running 256 threads on a 64 physical core machine, and we're getting a 94.5% uh, x multiplier, even though it like, because he was talking about hyper-threading earlier in the chat. Um, point taken. I'm not trying to, like, rub it in or anything. I'm, I'm just trying to, like, demonstrate. Um, I, I, have no, I have no issue with, uh, with criticism like that because, like, it, yeah, it does vary in certain situations. Um, all right. So we know that that run function is what's causing our scaling to, to shit. Uh, to go to shit, I guess. Um, where was it? So when we, we know that the scaling is basically perfect, seeing that 100x is really good, that's a, a solid verification that scaling of everything except for that run function is basically linear with course. So that means we have some other issue. So when we went into the run function, um, so basically how this works, I probably should explain what this function does. So uh, at the start of the function, uh, we're going to check if all of the lanes are enabled or disabled. Since this is the vectorized emulation stuff, we have the like eight different VMs running per thread. And this is saying while uh, at least one VM still has something to execute, then we're going to uh, see if the JIT entry address is none, which is basically saying, do we already know where we want to jump to in the JIT? Um, if we don't, then we're going to get the PC value. We're going to uh, find like the most frequent PC out of the set. Because keep in mind, this is like a, a vector. This has eight components. Then we're going to find the most frequent one. So we want to like we want to pick the most common path. So we run the most amount of VMs. Uh, right now, we don't have divergence, so it's always all of them are online. So uh, we're going to mask this uh, here. So we're going to compute which one should be running. Basically, anyone, any VM that wants to execute target path. So whoever wants to go down this most frequent path, 
is online, and then we disable ones that are like faulted out. We make sure this assertion is just for me, just in case somehow this mask results in no VMs existing, which should never happen because we like should break out of the loop in that case. Um, if the online raw is not equal to FF, so this is just a temporary thing. This is because I don't handle divergence yet. This is just saying, if there is divergence, just break out. So when I want to go handle divergence, there's gonna be a lot of code and tests and stuff. So we're just ignoring that for now. Then this is what we were looking at uh, just a few minutes ago. This aisle cache, we're gonna say, does the uh, target path, does the PC we're going to execute exist in the local aisle cache? And if it doesn't exist in the local aisle cache, that's like the lifted version of that instruction, then we're gonna go to the master cache, which is shared between all the threads. And we have to get a lock there, and that's why I have a, a local cache to kind of prevent going and grabbing this lock, because this lock will not scale with the number of threads we want. Um, then I will try and get an entry from the master cache. If I do already have a master cache entry for that target path, I clone it, and then at the end, I'll put it in the local cache. So I'll, I'll make a copy of the master cache's version of it and put it in my own. Otherwise, if it's not in the master cache, then we know that we need to lift that. So this is all the lifting code. It's going to go and like uh, invoke the target VM and say, hey, can you lift this PC for me? It's gonna return a graph back. I'm gonna optimize it. I'm gonna make sure the graph is good. I'm gonna JIT out the correct block for that graph and then I'm going to add it to the master cache. Uh, finally, I'm gonna, yeah, jit it out and that's it. So at the end, everything is is fine and dandy. So what I did here is I said print um, not in local cache. So this will tell us basically how frequently things go in this if statement, this entire if statement. And it's not very often because this local cache just ends up copying everything, which means this lock is not the bottleneck. We can see that it prints a couple times and then stops even with eight threads. So we don't care about this if statement at all because this can't, this can't affect our perf directly. Indirectly, it could like create more memory or something, but um, it's not executing it pretty much ever. We're, we're doing two million fuzz cases a second and we see it print eight times. So. That is not where the bottleneck is. So that means looking it up in the cache. Uh, this is a local operation. There's no lock here. Um, here we're looking up a unique label in the graph. So that shouldn't really have any cost. Here we're getting the JIT address. And then we're getting access to the page table. We're running the JIT. We're updating this local number like of dirty pages. So when the JIT's executing, if it ever writes to memory, it logs the page that has been modified such that when I go to reset the VM, I know explicitly what pages to reset. Um, then I update the resulting online. If there's a trap, in this case, there's never a trap. Trap. I don't, I don't think we ever see a, a trap here. So that shouldn't be an issue. So we can rule out that code. What I think it is, I think it's this MMU fault here. Um, we also ruled out that it's not a syscall by running strace, and it's just not making any syscalls. So we know it's not that. Um, here's fast full. that panics. Here's branch. So this branch here is really inefficient, but I think it should scale. The only thing that that leaves is this uh, MMU fault on an access. So in my JIT, um, everything's lazily paged in from the master VM. So when I create a VM, in this case, when I start an aisle session, I get a callback that says, please create your the master copy of the VM that you want to fork from. This is where like execution will begin from. This is like where you set up your, your fuzz case and resume execution from here. Um, so here we load up this Atari 2600 ROM. We uh, allocate room for the zero page, which is the RAM for the Atari. Um, we write out uh, the ROM into memory, and then we set ex an execution point. So when we create this master VM, we'll create all these threads. We'll make like uh, eight or let's say 256 threads. And those threads will have no memory mapped at all. 
even if the master had some memory mapped. And the way that's handled is the JIT will go execute stuff, and then the JIT will have a fault. And when we get to the fault handler here, I'm going to see, is this a real fault, or is this just something that needs to be paged in? I don't handle paging things in in the JIT because it's it's so complex that I did not want to handwrite that in assembly. So instead, I break up to here and I perform the, the operation manually, and then that would cause it to potentially uh, retain these faults. So what I could do potentially is I could say, um, I could comment this out. Now this is going to invalidate the, the JIT now because it's no longer going to it's going to like hit the first page fault, which will be like on the first instruction and it will fail. Um, but these, these MMU things, maybe they don't scale. Um, so let's see. So now we've only commented out one tiny amount of code and we can see if we have good scaling properties. So uh, similar to what we did before, I'm just going to see what it looks like single threaded. Looks good ballpark number and then we'll bring on 256 and once again we want to see like any multiplier over 70 or technically 64 and we know we have linear scaling um taking a while for things to spin up actually that took a lot less time and the scaling looks pretty solid um just going to give it a second to converge and it looks good so and that number looks like it's uh slightly less than 100x. In this case, that would make sense because we're actually doing some maths. Um, so I wouldn't expect to see as good of a hyper-threading speed up. But we see a 79x multiplier compared to the 64, which is like the minimum of what we expect. So that means that this code is absolutely responsible for the bottleneck. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for the maybe is that this... By, by not allowing this code to run, um, so if I put a print here, we're going we're gonna to see this a lot. So we're going to see this printed all the time because this is going to happen every fuzz case because our, our uh, test.c application does an actual fault. And this, this like idea, this concept I have just might not scale well. Um, Okay, so we see that every case, and nothing in here should really... We'll see it a couple times, the first case, and then it would stop if this didn't... Um, if we didn't have this cause an exception. And what I could do is I could special case this, and I could say if if adders.0... Uh, if adders.extract0 is equal to this, um, then... What can I do? How do I break out of this whole loop? I think it has a loop label, so I can just go here. Um, break. So if the fault is due to the leet access, then we're going to break out entirely. And this means we'll see ASDF a couple times when things get paged in the first few times, and then it will stop. Okay. So, and that means here we see a couple ASDFs. So now we know that this is actually running all of our code in the way that we would expect, which is good. Um, okay. So that means we can grab this number, do the exact same thing that we did before, spin up more threads, and see if we get scaling. And I'm guessing in this case we will. Um, I think something about these access calls is really slow. We're going to see a lot more ASDFs because we have 256 times 3 prints. Um, and then they stop. And then it looks like things have scaled out. Um, this number is going to climb for a bit longer just due to taking longer to spin up the threads. Um, absolutely, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's optimization. So in this case, that number looks good. And this is like our total uh, uh, scaling number for actual JIT because we're running real 6502 code. We're getting an 84x multiplier. Um, so what this is telling me is something inherently is not scalable about these operations. And I, I don't quite know what it would be, um, but I, I don't want to go too much 
into that right now. So I know that that's the issue. So I'm going to make note of that. Um, and I know that uh, read, write checks, don't scale. And they're not hitting syscalls, and I don't think they should have access to any globals. I guess maybe they're checking in with the master. Oh, those are going to check in with master every time because they're going to see if they can fault in. Okay, but our scaling looks really good. In fact, this number is actually climbing. It's even better. So whatever we had before the, like, 85x, we're probably now at, like, 88x. Um so that scaling is fantastic. So we're going to leave this in here. We're going to say, like, um, remove me when fixed. So that gives us kind of that optimization thing. So now what I want to do is I want to make a test application that does something. So is there something that I can write in C trivially that I could use to benchmark this. And I think the easiest thing I can think of is maybe like a, a like a random number generator, something that's like easy. I actually don't even want to use RAM because I, I, I don't know what this compiler is going to do. Um, so I'm going to do like, uh, in this case, ints are actually 64K, which makes it kind of difficult. <laughs> so we'll do a, a four, uh, we'll do ints i i j j four i i equals zero i is less than sixty five this and we need to make these unsigned for i equals zero or j j okay I'm just trying to write something that like is slow and then we just this is gonna be our marker for end of fuzz case um so that will like cause the fault. And I typically do this in applications where I'll like intentionally make them return out to nothingness. Um, so JJ looks good. So this will loop a, a boatload. In fact, maybe a lot, maybe too much. Is this, is this too much? 65, uh, 4.2 billion. Uh, we can drop that down. Let's, let's put it at like, uh, 250 million. Okay, and divided by uh, 60,000. So we'll have an outside loop of this and then an inside loop of, let's say, 4,200. So now this should be six, 60,000 times 4,200, and yeah, about 252,000. Okay, just making a comment of that math. And then I just need to do something in here. So let's take like a, a character. Uh, x equals zero. I don't know. Maybe we just uh, increment it infinitely. We'll see. We'll see what the code looks like um, when we build this. So we'll we'll whack this into Ida and see. Oh, constant is long. Well, yeah. Uh, oh, I need to say this is unsigned. Yup. Hey, old compilers. <laughs> This is CC65. Oops, I didn't want that. Um, this is, it's like, uh, it's the quote unquote standard um, 6502 com uh, C compiler. Uh, and apparently, it's probably, it's probably not going to be the best code gen. Although, I think there are optimization flags that I could maybe enable. I'm just setting up this. Uh, oops. There we go. Okay define a function, and then we know that our main function is in here, and here we see our, our loops. Um, I, don't, I don't even know what, what on earth is this doing? Ah, that's, doing a lot more, <laughs> that's doing a lot more than I expected. Um, Okay, let's see, let's see if this executes in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> if it doesn't, we'll just drop those numbers a little bit. And then we're going to have to get a count of how many instructions are executed. But, uh, ooh. Oh, there's a chance that this is maybe hitting an unimplemented instruction. I was, I was expecting this would be like a, a very clean loop. And if it were a clean loop, 
uh, SEC. What is what is that? Let's see if we can implement that quick. 6502 instruction set. S E S E C. Set carry flag. Okay. Um, well, that's pretty easy. Uh, we can implement that fast. Uh, that means someone's going to use the carry flag as well, which is not going to be great. So we have CLD, which clears the uh, decimal flag. And then we have SEC. We're going to load up a, a constant with all Fs, and then we're going to write this to the carry flag. And this is like Fs. So we're going to write all Fs into the carry flag. Set carry flag. Perfect. Okay, invalid register for reg write. Yep, because I, I have some macros that kind of protect uh, these things, and I'm just adding them as I use them so that I kind of have a better sense of like what I'm using in the 6502 state. Uh, SBC, what's this doing? Oh no. <laughs> Subtract memory from accumulator with bar. Okay, let's see if uh, maybe enable some optimizations. We'll uh, we'll fix this. Uh, let's see, CL sixty five. Surely there's like a optimized flag. Optimized con uh, code on a register keyword. Ooh, cool. Um, okay, dash O. Oh, we are. Uh oh. Uh oh. Maybe it's optimizing too hard. Maybe we don't want it to optimize. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm actually curious what the quote unquote unoptimized version of this is. There's a chance that the optimized version is actually more complex because it's getting a little bit more creative. Um, Six five zero two set yeah this okay. Oh, still looks really complex. Like, what is it doing? Is all of this really needed for a couple for loops? For two for loops? You're adding it in the middle, right? Or in the body. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm just incrementing a value in a, in a loop. Um, I just want to see, like, what this code gen looks like. Yeah, if I just do one loop, and you know what? I'll even cap it to 50, so it's it doesn't even exceed, and we'll make it a character. Um, like, we can't get much simpler than that. There's no... Uh, nothing is exceeding a signed boundary. This is going to uh, wrap, but that's fine because it's unsigned, so that is, um, that is defined behavior. Oops, and make clean all... Sadly, I don't have a better way of like really doing this, but whacking it into IDE each time. So obviously, eventually I'll go implement those instructions, but the goal is to benchmark right now. And to do that, okay, this is gonna look cleaner. All right, that's what I expected. It's still uh, a, a bit complex, so but we should be like, everything's fitting in a register. Okay. Yeah, I think this one we might implement everything of. So this one might work. The second voice is quiet. Yeah, the um, the microphone is gonna only pick up things uh, by like proximity. Dec, decrement memory by one, NZ flags. If we just look at, uh, we can just grab I and C. Call this DEC, change this to a sub, and we're done. <laughs> okay, compare. Ooh, ooh. Is that just a fancy subtract? Uh, what is this? A minus M. Compare memory with accumulator. Okay. Um, compare memory with accumulator. A minus M. I don't know what this like flag out here is. Oh, I think these all are shifted. So we need the N flag, the Z flag, and the carry flag. Um, ah, carry flag computation is going to be a pain. Where is it doing a compare? Uh, here. Oh, it's doing, a, it's doing a compare with 50. 
you know, this is probably a really, really, really literal compiler. So I bet if we do this, while JJ, JJ minus minus, I bet this will change the shape to not have a compare. Because I don't want to implement the carry flag, because if I implement that in a rush, I'm probably going to do it wrong, and that's going to be a big issue. Because carry flags can be kind of tough. Um, they vary a lot on architectures, and it sometimes can get really trippy for me because I'm used to them operating in certain ways, and if they operate in a different way, like on ARM, they're the opposite of x86. Okay, so in this case, yeah, uh, we did get rid of that compare. <laughs> okay, CLC, that's a uh, clear carry flag, I'm guessing. I mean, I probably shouldn't guess. Yeah, clear carry flag. So CLD, we'll just take this. This is now CLC, and this is now writing a zero to the carry flag. Done. Come on. ADC, inter, uh, ADC, add with carry. Really? Why is it doing an add with carry? Is it due to the... You know, I can maybe get rid of this ad. <laughs> that might do the trick. I just need, I just need something that will execute a loop. <laughs> <laughs> SBC, uh, is that subtract with uh, with borrow? God, come on! Bit wise, not something easy like bit wise. It's I just want a loop. Like that's all I have here is a loop. Like what? What is? What is this? What? What? Does the compiler generate for this? Maybe it's. I don't. I don't want to do that. That's risky. Um, we're just decrementing a, a, a known value fifty. You know, we'll use the register keyword too. We'll really give it the the fu. <laughs> Apparently, this uses the register keyword. Or there was actually a, another optimization pass that mentioned that it would. Come on. This, 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 this. I just want to know what the perf is. Okay. Hey, that looks better. So this is, that's performing the faulting access. And then what? what is that? What is it doing at the end? Oh, is that like cleaning up the stack or memory? Maybe that's what it's doing. SBC. SBC. Subtract with borrow. Oh, is that where where did it be? So it sets the carry flag subtract with borrow. Why wouldn't it just subtract one? Oh my gosh. Oh no. Well, subtract with borrow is probably not too bad. Um, although it updates the carry flag and the V flag. Oh my gosh, come on. Uh, <sighs> do I just write a loop in assembly? Maybe. Like I would, I would think that this. Would, <laughs> I would think that this would like load a fifty. Deck. Jump. And then like a B and E. <laughs> that that would be what I would guess. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's doing enough without all of this. I don't know how many instructions this is running. Um, uh, we just need to rebuild this. Let's see how many instructions this runs. So, um, to get that, I need to enable the the counters here. Um. At the top of this, I need to set this to true, and then up here in the JIT, I need to set uh, inst start. I need to set this to true. So that's going to keep track of how many instructions executed, which is going to be constant, and then I'll just make note of it, and then I'll turn off the, the overhead of those things. Because logging the instructions that have executed is actually going to be a lot of the cost. Um, and here we'll just print, we'll just uh, print 
Alright, we'll panic. Instructions executed. And actually we will print it. Oh, is that gonna exit every time we do the branch and we don't have the optimized branching? Um okay, well we'll wing it. God, yeah, this won't give us a total count of instructions executed. Oh, that's why I wanted a loop so I could just know. Hmm. Hmm. Trace buff dot one. Okay, we'll see. What was the first arch architecture I learned? I'm guessing you mean like assembly in that case. Um XD6. Okay, so we'll get rid of this print. That's gonna give a warning here. And we should see like a couple different values and then they'll repeat and then we can add those all together manually and then that will tell us how many instructions are executed. It's not perfect. Um, okay, I'm guessing it's 1020, 1045 plus eight is the number of instructions we execute. Uh, 1045 plus eight, giving it repeats. Okay, so then I can turn this tracing stuff off, false. And set this to false. Ah. And now we can see. So 1053, th that's, that's a pretty small uh, case. So there's a chance that we're going to be measuring a lot of overhead. But, you know, hey, that's, that's fine. So this is on a single thread, whatever this converges to. I don't know, 350 seems to be. Oh, dip in 350, 350. 350, yeah, I think 350 is safe, probably a little bit more than 350, so 350, uh, whoops, 350,000 times 1053, so that's emulating 368 uh, million instructions per second, yeah, it will scale, but we don't have branches implemented in a fast way yet, so this is actually not going to be the best benchmark, because we're not I need it to be like really dense in one location. Um, but hey, this is like the startup of an Atari uh, benchmarked. So then this number, we're just gonna wait for it to settle in and then we'll multiply it. And these numbers will be a little bit low because we're, we've got a lot of overhead because the we're resetting the VM a lot, like like hundreds of millions of times per second. Actually, about 30 million times a second. But hey, we'll take this number. We'll multiply it by our 1053. And we're emulating 32 billion 6502 instructions per second. <laughs> Which is pretty good. Um, I'm guessing if I added a hot loop in there, where it actually like decremented in a loop and we weren't measuring the overhead of resetting the VM 30 million times per second... Um, God, I really want to know that. Let me, let me, uh, I'm going to write something quick and then it'll be the end of the stream. <laughs> I, I, I need to, I need to know because this is, this is not, I need like a, and I, I just, I just don't want to implement that carry. Um, what, what else, how else can I implement a loop? Maybe if I did, maybe if I did something really gross where I did like, while int uh where's a valid memory address i i can just say like 40 while that is greater than zero do i want to say that while it's not equal to zero that's probably a little safer then here we'll say this we'll set this equal to oxfff unsigned uh unsigned int Okay, um, I don't know if that's actually going to emit a loop. It should just not, well, since it has a memory access, it might have to. Oh, yeah, 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 quiet. Okay, nice, okay, here. Mm. This will have a memory access in the loop, which will be really slow. So I kind of want to avoid that, or A. Yeah, um, what was the optimize? There's like an optimize flag, but respect the register flag 
O honor the register keyword. O R. Okay. O R, and then we'll say uh, register unsigned in X is equal to O X F F F F U, and then while X X minus minus. So I think this is going to get us in the same carry flag issue that we had before. But maybe with that register keyword, uh, SBC. Ah. Ah. Why isn't it just doing a normal sub? If I do minus equals one, does that change it? Is it like trying to check if, uh, if an underflow happens? I... I guess that doesn't fit in the register, so that doesn't really make any sense. Patch up the carry in Ida. Um, yeah, so basically we had an SBC here. Is it using the carry flag? So here it sets the carry flag, and then does an SBC. Um, and then of one... But wouldn't that subtract two? Uh, with borrow. A, so we take the A register, or we take, yeah, we do take the, this implies the accumulator. So we take the A register, which is loaded from here, and then we store it out to here. So this is like our variable here. Our, yeah, our variable, this B and E branch on equal. So this is where our variable X is stored. So this is saying, um, we're going to take the A register, which is loaded with that. We're going to set the carry. Then we're going to perform the subtract with borrow, which is going to sub A minus M minus C. Isn't that going to subtract two? Because it's going to take the A register. It's going to subtract the cons. Uh, it's going to take, it's going to subtract the address, in this case it's an immediate one, and then it's going to subtract the carry flag. But the carry flag is one. Isn't that going to subtract two? And it's going to store that? Right? Because <laughs> this puts a one, SEC puts a one in the carry flag, and then this does A minus M minus C, which... Unless it's M minus C in parentheses. <laughs> in which case... In, <laughs> but that's really strange to me. Um, let's see if there's inline assembly support. Um, uh, what is sub? Uh, let's do deck or DEA, I think. Is that, is that valid? Is that how you do inline assembly? Uh, ooh. Ooh, okay. So it wants this. Oh, okay. So we might just be able to do it ourselves then. So we could load. Um, and I think we can do multi-line in here somehow. Can we just do this? Is this fine? Is this going to be happy? Do I need to put semicolons after everything? So I'll do LDA OXFF. And then DEA should deck. Oh, God. Uh, semi here, not here. Oh no, unexpected new line. Okay. Um, it doesn't like that, does it? Okay. All right. <laughs> so load the A register with FF. Then we decrement A, D E A. I think decrements A, right? What? What? Um. Deck. Where is it? D-E-X. Oh, we can decrement X or something in the zero page or, okay. So dex, so there's D-E-X and D-E-Y. So we can load X with FF. I don't know if we can load, why, why does it allow D-E-A? Oh, is that like one of the undefined or one of the like undefined opcodes that actually has a behavior and this compiler is maybe aware of it? Um, then we can do a, a LDY. Um, 
LDA, okay, or LDX, and that can take an immediate, and then LDY, that can take an immediate. So load X with FF, load Y with FF. Then we're gonna do a, oh, we need a label. Maybe we should use a actual um, assembly here. Gvim test.s uh, main. I don't know what it looks like, uh, but we'll say like, what was the fault? The fault was just a store, uh, sta to 1337. Okay, so that's our fault. And then we can get rid of main here and we can compound link with test.s as well, hopefully. Uh, I don't know where that file went, but uh, it's somewhere on the machine. Okay. Uh, what? Oh, that's the same file name, so it actually replaces it for the output. <laughs> We're going to say, like, test main. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes it's the little things in life that get you. Okay, uh, startup doesn't exist. Vectors doesn't exist. Okay, they're warnings. Those are warnings, right? And then do I need to say, like, this is a global? No, it doesn't like that. Okay, we'll just call it main. And let's see, let's see if this actually uh, calls our main function here. So Maybe this is why people say to write an assembly when you're doing 6502 and not to use compilers. Because it seems to be a pain in the ass. Okay, P. Oh, well, well, there's our application. Oh, it didn't even use the startup stuff. Okay, we probably don't even need that. Okay, so now we're just now we're just writing 6502. <laughs> okay, so let's do a LDA. Um, was that what it was? LDA? Yeah. LDX, uh, OXFF, LDY, OXFF. Then we're gonna do a uh, uh, Y loop. And then we're gonna have an X loop. And inside here, we're gonna do a DEX. That's a thing, right? Dex and DUI. Okay, so Dex. That's going to update the zero flag. So if the result of the operation is zero, um, so we're going to say if the, uh, is it BNE? Yeah. So if the result is non zero, then we go to the X loop. And here we're going to do this. Okay, load X there, load Y that. So, um,. Load Y, FF, then we're going to load X, FF, then we're going to decrement X. If it's non-zero, then we go to X, so we loop until it becomes zero, which will be after 255 iterations. I think, yeah. Uh, off by one errors are tough. Um, branch not equal Y loop. So we're going to decrement X that many times, FF, Inclusive, 255, inclusive down to z one to zero transition. It might be 255 iterations. Uh, I'm not sure. Why Why am I so bad at off by ones? Like, it's when when I start thinking about off by ones in my head, then it, like, prevents me from, like, yeah. actually thinking about it correctly. So, dex here. We're going to loop here until x becomes zero. Once x becomes zero, then we'll continue. We'll decrement y, and then we'll loop... Uh, back to the Y loop, which will load X, which will loop again, and then this will decrement, and once both X, once Y has decremented all the way down to zero, then we'll uh, perform our um, store. Unexpected garbage characters. Um, is it the labels? Two? Um, maybe it should be that? Trailing garbage characters. Well, that's rude. Uh, okay, let's find an example of uh, uh, 6502 Atari 2600 CC65. Uh, 
uh, init GitHub. <laughs> uh, uh, it didn't get us. It didn't get us what we wanted. Uh, Atari. Yeah, there's like a specific file that I've like already looked at that I'm like, quote unquote, comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, son of a bitch, really? Uh, was it like a knit? Uh, we'll just find any CRT zero here. This is fine. Okay, what does a label look like? I just need a branch. This. Oh. Okay. I can comply. Is that is that your is that your final complaint? Oh, I bet that is like a global, and these are. Hmm. I feel like we're mimicking this quite closely. Load X. It doesn't like one and two. Is it the FF? How do you how do you load a constant? Oh, that and a dollar sign. Mm, and it does it like oh, okay. Load X one B. Oh. FF. There we go. Perfect. Looks good. And we can probably go back to the original formatting. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure it built in the way that we expected. And 6502. Good, 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 good. Getting, getting fast at that. All right. Load Y, load X, decrement X. Let's make sure the graph looks good. Yeah. Decrement X, branch, if not equal to zero back up to the start of this until that falls through and then we decrement y and then we go here until that zero and then at the very end we store a um leap which will cause a fault so now these fuzz cases will do more dui not implemented well that's an easy one dex where's dex here's dex take dex copy paste dui rename these to y as long as the registers are fine, it's, it's good. So take the Y register, subtract one, store it into Y, update negative and zero flags. Uh, inv. Oh, um, we need to somehow have this terminate. Uh, how do I? Maybe if I just infinite loop here. Uh, how do you branch? Is it jump? I don't think it's B in this. Okay, I think it is jump. They like. Okay. So now. Okay, our, our fuzz cases per second is a lot lower, which is good. That's what we want. Hopefully, we're only on one thread. <laughs> it's like, that's really bad. We're going to turn on this tracing temporarily, like we did before, just so we can get that counter. And it's going to be, like, very close to 65,535. Uh, where is the other one here? This true. Okay. Okay. Oh, that, that seems like a lot. Um, is that right? Is that wrong? Is that maybe right? Load Y, load X, decrement X. So I would expect that to loop 255 times and then that to loop 255 times. So isn't, isn't, mm, Y, what would cause that? Dex, D-E-Y, branch to Y loop. I mean, I'm not complaining, because it's just more instructions, but that seems... We could take a look at the trace. Um, dex, branch not equal. If it's not equal to zero... Yeah. Maybe I, Maybe I just don't know how these things work, or maybe I have a bug. I don't think so. 
There's a chance that there could be a bug in my, my lifter here. Um, let's see what I lift to. I can actually just peek into that, and then we can read <laughs> a language that I know. Um, dump dot in aisle session here. We'll just uncomment this. Oops. Uncomment this. Run it locally. I don't know. I don't know 6502. Maybe I'm doing something stupid. But I, I don't... I don't... It looks... Load X, load Y. Looks pretty straightforward to me. Um, and now we'll just pop this open in... Here we'll want the SVG from uh, wherever we are. Uh, soft serve. Oops. Soft serve six five zero two test and graph. Okay. So this is saying we're going to load. Uh, okay. What are our loops? So we've got here's obviously our inner loop. We're doing some zero extension. This is, that's FO4, and if we turn on labels, FO4, so here's our DEX, we take target one, we then, sub, uh, we zero extend it, and then we subtract one from it, uh, LR21 minus one, we zero extend the result, and then we store that into target one, and then we compute flags. Here we're gonna say if this is equal to ILR7, which is probably zero. So if it's equal to that, then we set this into ILR32. And then our branch is gonna say if ILR32 is equal to zero, then we go to block three. So if the zero flag is zero, then we go to, uh, to block five, otherwise we go to block three. So that looks correct. And then this side, this part of the loop, this one is assigning the FF constant to target one. And it's updating these to constants. So uh, the zero flag and these flags get updated. And then in our final loop, we should just do the exact same thing. Get target two, subtract one from it, zero extend it, write it back out. And the zero extension is, is actually gonna kill our perf because we're gonna do like a lot of stuff we don't need to do. And then it's gonna loop back up. Um, well, I don't really know why it's doing that many instructions, but we're, we're just gonna take it and, and, and figure it out. It could be a bug in our stuff, but right now we're not looking for bugs, we're looking for perf. So we're gonna do a quick change at the top. Uh, set this to false in our JIT. In our JIT, we're gonna turn this off. And now this will tell us our single thread performance. So, and we have this like extra zero extension and committing flags that never are necessarily getting used. So there's like a lot of ways that this is a kind of a slow case. We would actually want to do like dex a couple times. We want to unroll that loop. Uh, in fact, that's probably what I'm gonna do in a second here. So it looks like this is probably about 4,700-ish, probably on the low side. And then we know it's executing this many instructions. Uh, so that's getting 614,000 per second. So this is on a, a number insters. And then this um, insters per second single core. And then let's bring up all of them. And this will be the final perf, perf number we'll go with today. Obviously, we can add more optimization passes to propagate those flags a bit better and have things uh, have the registers not saved at the end of every block. Um, it's the main reason I made a, a graph-based IL. And we'll just see what this kind of converges to. So we've got, uh, okay, 740. It's still climbing, still climbing. I don't want to interrupt it when it's uh, making progress. It's just since it took so long for threads to spin up, we're kind of, and we're averaging over the entire time, it takes a while for this number to kind of grow to what it's supposed to be. It's starting to slow down. I'm guessing like 775 is probably where it will like start to stop. It's, well, it's rampant. 
It's ramping. Oh, it dipped down for a second there. Okay, so it's probably gonna hover here. Maybe it'll climb up to 780. We're, we're gonna take this number and we'll multiply it by the number of instructions with this 130 and we'll turn on digit grouping. Okay, we have a uh, 101 billion emulated 6502 instructions per second. All right, and that's with a tight loop with no unrolling. Um, wow, that's actually really good. Okay, well, I'm happy with that number. So this is our final number of the day, uh, 6502 instructions per second. Not too bad. And that's including the overhead. Obviously, we're spending a lot more time in the VM, so that's not much of an issue anymore. Um, but this is not even with the final optimizations. So whenever we uh, access a target register, that's a memory access. So we have four memory accesses in this loop. We've got four in here. We've got zero extensions, which are not necessary because um, writing the register, it's necessary, but reading it, it isn't. Um, uh, we've got flag computation for flags that aren't used. So target 11 in this case is going to be the um, the negative flag, which is never used. Um, so like that could get optimized out of the graph. And there's just a bunch of different things like that. Technically, the, uh, the like post DOM one, we'd want to like move the updating of this to the end of the block before we like return out or do something. But these perf numbers look pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I don't know what the 6502 actually ran. Uh, 6502, the like original one. <laughs> and keep in mind, that's not cycles. That's instructions per second. So um, I guess it varied. What was the original one? What was the original one? 66502. Uh, MHZ. Okay. Uh, 6502 was a 1.5. Okay, so what was the first one? Probably one. Was it exactly one? Set to, okay. 6502 clock speed. Um. What is, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it's like one megahertz, probably. It says one to three. The first, oh, what was the very first one? How is that not mentioned? Like that, that's like, that's the stat. That's how you like make a magazine article. Um, low clock frequency, okay. Maybe it's like some weird expression. Uh, internal, okay, despite low clock speeds, typically one to two megahertz. Okay, so we'll say 1.5, because we know concretely that th this one was 1.5. So we'll say, uh, what was that? And let's take a look at the instructions we're running. You know, we don't want to, we, we want a fair comparison. So we're doing DEX and B and E. And if we look at the 6502 reference here, we're doing, uh, we're going to compute the cost of our, of our loop. Uh, dex, dex two cycles. So our dex is two cycles. Our dey is two cycles. And what is our b and e? Uh, two two cycles. I like that. That's easy. And then ldx uh, from an immediate two cycles. And LDY will also be two cycles. Um, so that means that we can just divide the processor rate, this, divided by two, and that's going to give us the number of instructions per second that an actual 6502A processor would get for this specific loop. And now we can take our number from here, and we can divide it, and we're, <laughs> we're 135 thousand times faster than a 6502. All right. <laughs> and with that, that's going to be the end of the stream. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope you guys had fun. 1.19 <laughs> megahertz for the 26. Oh, well, now we got to do that. 
I can't, uh, or 1.19, well, <laughs> I gotta eke everything out of what I have. So, uh, what can I do? I can get this number, yep, and divide by this. Okay, so we're, all, we're, we're, we're effectively able, <laughs> we're effectively able in this case to emulate 170,746 Atari 2600s on one machine. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have room to improve. We probably could improve this by, if we unrolled these loops, because um, our branches are expensive, you know, do people want to know that? Do people want to see it unrolled? As long as I unroll it by a factor, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to put this to FO, and that means that I can unroll these by 16. Uh, P, uh, 15P, is that right? Yeah, that's 16. And then YY 15P. Okay, so this should have 16. And 16, so we're doing a little bit of unrolling. Now we're now we're cheesing it. So we <laughs> we're really cheesing these numbers now, but that's fine. That's what that's what you do to get papers. So this is uh, Atari uh, number of Atari 2600s, and that is based on this many instructions per second. Okay, and then when we unroll it. Uh, it's looking good. Uh, I need to get the instruction count because it has technically changed and I don't want to do the math because there's a chance that I do the math wrong and then not apples to apples and, and stuff, you know. So we'll just do this. This will bring up all the threads. This is going to get really spewy. But as long as it's in like the ballpark of that number of instructions executed, which maybe this one will be in the right number. Okay. So now we have this many instructions executed and get rid of that and get rid of that and run it. So now we have that unrolling, which will make uh, which will make our like register allocation look a lot more like it would if we had like full graph magic, you know, stuff. So this is instructions in the unrolled case. And I don't remember what we were getting before. Um, I don't even remember. Uh, 60,000? No. Uh, 47, uh, 776,000? Oh, you know what? It's actually about the same. I'm, I'm actually really surprised. Um, you know what? We didn't build it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, mm, okay, true. There's a chance that we, like, uh, don't have the right number of subtracts and we're, like, missing the zero and it's causing us to, like, end one of the loops earlier. So we're going to see how many instructions we're getting here. Uh, 4097. Okay, something's wrong. So all I really care about, do I need to, like, add one to those maybe? Um, where is our code here? So we've got 16 DEX and we have 16 DEY. That should result in F0. At, at the end of this, it should be B0, right? It'll subtract 16. Um, maybe I've got a bug in the lifter because we were seeing like the weird loop iteration. Let's see if I just put this to 16, and I'm gonna make it not hex, like just just in case. So this should, we'll see how many instructions we get. Uh, probably should build it. 37, is that right? Uh, 32 plus 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. Um, Okay, so that's correct. So if I put, so that 37 was fine. And then if I put this to um, 160, can I do that? It should now be, uh, 
Oh, build it. 352. So that should be, if we do the math, why is this calculator so slow? This one. Okay. So this should execute once per iteration. So we should see like uh, 18 instructions get executed 10 times plus one plus uh, plus 17 times 10 plus one. Yeah, 352. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what's the highest 16? What's FO? Uh, FO is 240. I don't know. Build it, run it. 527, then we'll put this as 240. Four. What? DEX, branch not equal, DEY, branch not equal. What am I doing wrong? Like, it seems like the LDX seems to be throwing us for a loop. If we do this, we get 4090, uh, build it. If we do this, we get 527. If we do this, we get 782, which, is that correct? Um... Seems about right. Can I can I do math in here? Do you think? No. <laughs> we'll <gonna> try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oops. Uh, two forty, and then here we'll do uh uh, uh sixteen times four. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> oh look at that. So ten. 160. Oh, I didn't rebuild it. Oh, my God. <laughs> 2822. Am I, am I doing something stupid here? Maybe. Um, mm, like, when we put this to 240... Forty ninety seven. Is that right? Is that just correct? Like, so these will execute. We'll see this happen two hundred forty times. So we'll see eighteen times two hundred forty instructions execute. Yeah, that's already over the amount we want. Oh, I can do this. There we go. Now we have a hot loop on the inside and not on the outside. And build it. Jeez. Okay. Oh, basically 65,535. It, it's just off by a bit because these are 240. Um, and that's the maximum that we can put them to. Technically, this one we can actually put to the full 255 because we're only decrementing one at a time. So the inside loop is kind of what we're bottleneck or benchmarking. So 65,792 instructions. Okay. And we've got, a, we've got a lot of Vim windows open. So 65,972. 792. And that checks out. Turn off j tracing. Turn off this. All the threads are online. Let's see what we can do. And we can put this on for uh, aesthetics. <laughs> no. No, it's in the, in the server room. Okay. Okay, so now that's running, and we're just going to wait for that number to uh, settle in. <laughs> but yeah, here's all the cores. Yep. So this number is kind of a little bogus. I mean, I guess, so my branches are really expensive. Since it's vectorized emulation, I actually have to check if, uh, if there's divergence on every branch. So my branches are, are pretty uh, complex. If I show you... A blog. I've got. Uh, um, I talk about how conditional branches work specifically for this reason, and we'll see that at the end, this is what a conditional branch looks like. So this 
executes every single time we do a conditional branch. Um, so unrolling is going to give us a pretty massive increase because we won't have this going on every single iteration of that tight loop. It's not going to decrement something by one and then perform these incredibly expensive operations. Um, okay, it looks like it's settled in at 398. Okay, so we'll say this is... We have this many fuzz cases a second. Keep in mind, we're still resetting the VM, so there's still overhead and everything involved here. Multiply this by 65792. No typos. Now we're doing 262 billion instructions per second, and then if we divide that by our Ataris, which is, um, uh, was this? Yeah, that's our Atari version. Compute this, and we're, we're in this tight, like this unrolled no memory access or low memory access loop, we have uh, 441,000 Ataris. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy with that. So that is where we're going to leave it. So hope you guys had fun. Thank you for tuning in. See you around. <laughs>